So, Peter, you've written another book. Journey to the Esoteric Circle, Reclaiming Your Cosmic Birthright During the Apocalypse. Yes, this is my ninth book, and uh, this is my most significant one, as I have put everything into this as a culmination of uh, 30-some-odd years of, of teaching from people like uh, Charles Ashenden right there, and Robin Amos, and, and uh, you, Ted Nottingham, and um, it is a it is a privilege and a, an honor to be here with you. You have created a very significant piece, particularly timely. And I'd like to say a few things about the book before entering in dialogue on the themes that it covers. For instance, the fact that you speak to our times now without pulling any punches, really laying it out, the state of Christianity, the state of the human psyche, the good and the not so good of technology, the capitalist gurus on YouTube, all of that in order to cut to the heart of the matter. And I'll be quoting a few things here and there as we seek to explore what it is that you have given us. And we'll see where it takes us. So I'll begin with a quote, if you don't mind. This book you're reading right now has one purpose, to gather up those of us who have ears to hear. So this is for seekers everywhere of all kinds, of all traditions of no traditions, escaping a Christianity which you have defined as a two-dimensional religion, completely immersed in the ethically based, shallow, outward imitation of right moral behavior. And we know that across the world, in the farthest reaches of this planet, people are hungering for transformational experience, for encounter with the sacred, for that which our Western civilization, which is disintegrating before our very eyes, aggressively seeks to crush the numinous, the mysterious, the wonder. And you tell us that True spiritual work is done to remember what has been forgotten in the somnambulism of this place we currently inhabit. Yes, you're quite a wordsmith along with someone who knows what he's talking about. Spiritual work is an act of bravery and sacrifice and longing for our true origins. We're going to unpack all of that in some way or another. And you say up front that to, to, we are not trying to put together a patchwork of the common wisdom of all the ages, which is quite an interesting discernment from the eclectic new age, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's something else. And finally, I want to say you make the point this is not a trivial new age gimmick inspired by a sick society which can be downloaded like some free app on your iPhone. Yes, those quick shortcuts that people love. And so you speak of this esoteric circle. I'm going to give you one more quote and then let you tell us about your sense of what you are referring to. You speak of a spiritual wisdom which has been passed down through the ages and is still accessible. So tell us more. This is a book that is designed um, for those who are going through a spiritual awakening during this chaotic time, during this time of apocalypse. And the introduction is, is really focusing on the, the etymology of the word apocalypse, which really means to uncover, to reveal. It's not about destruction. We are fascinated with destruction. We are fascinated with our own demise. 
And as we go through this, I found out through my the last you know thirty two years of of life here as an adult that the church that I had grown up in um, did not contain the wise men and women who who uh, needed to be there to pass on this inner teaching of uh, true Christianity. And what I discovered in as a pastor, um, I grew up in the United Methodist Church. Uh, I became a United Church of Christ um, pastor, and I still am. And I still pastor churches. I still preach. I still give communion, baptize, all that. But I have never found anyone in the Protestant church who was able to tell me um, what this was all about. There was no one there to tell me what Paul meant when he said we need to pray without ceasing. There was no one who taught me about the inner teachings of karma and of resurrection. And there was no one there to teach me a- about um, changing who I was. And as I, as I discovered in my 20s, I was not just one person. I was a whole lot of people. And I was scattered. And I was legion as Christ describes that. And there was no one there to tell me this until a guy named Charles Ashton um, plucked me out of the fire and said, stop your daydream. Charles Ashton, his picture's right there. And I do a lot of uh, uh, videos about Charles um, on my YouTube channel. And Charles said, stop your daydream. You're wasting your time. But I didn't know what it meant to wake up. And I realized that this inner church that I was longing for was uh, a lifelong learning, a lifelong awakening. And this esoteric journey that we're on is not, there's no quick fix to this. In our society, it's it's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, you know, we we need a pill, we need an ice bath, or we need uh, a crystal. And within Christianity that Charles taught, um, true orthodoxy, that um, there was an inner circle that that preceded Christianity, preceded Judaism, and runs all the way through all the major religions. And that's what I call the esoteric circle. It is this this perennial teaching, the psychological teaching that really teaches what it means to be um, spiritual instead of just religious. I the, was. Uh, this is what Gurdjieff would call the conscious circle of humanity, right? Yes. Uh, and yet it yes. is, and yet it is found at the heart of the deepest Christianity, out of the teachings of Mount Athos, which is why it I wanted is, to. Was... I, I wanted to underscore that it's not a patchwork. It's not generic perennial. Ultimately, in the book, you claim Christ as your guide, Absolutely. and yet. It predates. It is beyond that. I I want I want to read yeah. one thing that's quite extraordinary. The way we reconnect with the esoteric circle is to dive deeply into our own individual lives, unpacking and clearing away. And then you use that word, karmic burden. If you want to enter that as well. Yeah, the karmic burden is huge. And that is something which is not taught in seminary. It is not taught at Sunday school. It's not taught from the pulpit. And it's a little known um, Christian doctrine that um, it is essential to at least my understanding of what we're doing here. We have inherited karma and we have personal karma. And so much, and this is my own experience, as, as Rudolf Steiner would say, you know, we're spiritual scientists who have to discover this on our own. And this is a hard fought knowledge that we have that is grace to us. None of it's obtained by reading a book or, or, or none of this is this is all graced to us. But this knowledge that we have about karma is so essential to us because we have to unpack it. We have to unburden ourselves from it. And some of this is inherited from our families, through our bloodline. And we have to be able to learn how to, um, how to let go of this. 
and this is the rub. This is this is where we need to have a uh, we need to have a teacher, and we need to have essentially a group as well. But essentially, we need to have a teacher who's going to be able to help guide us through these stages. You know, one of the things that was amazing about Charles as a kind of an Obi Wan Kenobi type of a character for me. Um, he never sat down and taught me doctrine. He never sat down and taught me um, the dogma and what was right belief and what was wrong belief. He uh, he allowed me to slowly awaken, slowly awaken. You know, we, we cannot just suddenly just be awakened by, um, by a, a baptism or by a, a ritual. It's a slow awakening. And the book goes through this sense of awakening and that, you know, we have three stages, don't we? We have awakening, purification, and illumination. And that illumination stage, we want to jump to that. And we want to have a, a you know, a, this, this uh, little pump of, of dopamine or we want to have this high, um, but it, it takes sacrifice. And Charles had this story of um, Bishop Anthony Bloom saying that, you know, American Christians in particular were great about saying they would do anything for Christ and do anything to be a Christian. But but when it came to getting up on that cross, our own cross, our own Golgotha, that was too much. That was too much to to actually say I sacrifice. You know, this esoteric journey is a hard, hard look at who we are and how uh, how splintered and how um divided we are and you know robin always said that you know our the goal of this and i quote this in the book the the goal of all this is to is to build a coherent psychological structure and return it to god we have to build what moravia would call you know a magnetic center we have to have a, a fort we have to have a um, some kind of outpost where we begin to observe how splintered and how bifurcated um, we are one of the things that i find quite extraordinary is when you make a connection between the second birth born from above christ nicodemus those glorious words and and perhaps this is a first ever joseph campbell's the hero's journey that is quite a unique, original, uh, paradoxical, holistic connection. Tell us some about that and take us into this deep dive into the psyche, into the individual purification process in order to connect with the esoteric circle. Yeah. You know, Joseph Campbell was one of the original teachers that I had. I, I, I was introduced to Joseph Campbell before I met Charles Ashton, and Joseph Campbell continues to be one of my absolute favorites because he universalized Christ for me. He made Christ into this <laughs> into this universal religion for me, and it made it relevant to me as it connected it with all the other religions. And I realized that there was this this thread that ran through all the religions and Christ was saying the same thing that Buddha was saying and Moses saying the same thing as Hinduism. It's just this amazing uh, journey though, that we have to take and all through mythology, there's this idea that each one of us, each one of us has to make this journey. And this esoteric journey is what this book is about. And, and that journey, take this journey, that journey, means to translate it directly into, for instance, fourth way terms or monastic instructions, means inner efforts, use of our free will, objective awareness of ourselves to change, to become yes. conscious, the journey into consciousness instead of, as you say, somnambulism. So this hero's journey is that inner effort process. I just want to specify that because that's yeah. the beautiful connection. 
it is the it, it is that it's this it, it is hard work this is hard work and what, what this hard work is you you're working on you because who you are is not who you're supposed to be you're scattered and this hero's journey when you when you when you dive deeply into your psyche and you realize how controlled you are by negative emotions and how um as gurdjieff would say you know a, a splinter in a finger can ruin someone's day you know we you can you can be taken off course so easily and how fragile we are and that's not that's not returning a coherent uh psychological structure to god we have to have something that is solid, solid ground that, you know, the, the idea of having a firm foundation, not out of sand. You have to have a solid foundation and you cannot do that the way you are. And it takes effort. It takes huge efforts, massive efforts. And those efforts, um, you know, it, it depends on what your cosmic job is, but those efforts, especially meditation. You know, just the fundamental idea of of getting up in the middle of the night or getting up every day in your in the beginning of every day and meditate and spending twenty to thirty minutes examining your thoughts, you know, really working hard and saying, mm -hmm. what is the, what about me? What if, what if, what are some of the things that I could do? And this is one of the things that I do at the end of each day is I examine my day backwards. And I examine it and try to make sure that whatever I've been through, I what have I done wrong? Do I need to correct it? Do I need to say, uh, ask for forgiveness? And examine and, and, it. And you know that this is the ancient Eastern Orthodox exercise of the examination of conscience. Yes. You know, right out of the tradition, the teachings. Uh, I, 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 I do want to say, as you speak of all these big efforts, and yet my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Because ultimately, these big efforts of un self-understanding, self-purification, cleansing the inside of the cup, leads to that meditative silence being your presence in the moments of your life, living fully your reality outside of illusion and imagination and therefore there's something lightness of being right yes. ultimately it, yeah you're cleansing you're cleansing yourself you're you know as Teresa of Avila would say you're cleansing that mirror that you have been throwing mud on with all of the the negative emotions and you're cleansing that so you see the reflection of Christ the risen Christ and you realize that through those efforts, you're you're gaining energy. These, you know, Gurdjieff talks about these fine hydrogen, this 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 element of of the energy that we gain through these efforts. No effort on the way is ever discarded. You know, it's all of uh, this all. It's all about this accumulation of mm -hmm. of this energy that we need in order to have this solid uh, foundation, so we can return something to God. When my body passes when i die i need to have something that is permanent we're after a sense of permanence we're after something that is that is going to last after this frail grass-like body goes what so you, happens you, you, know, you, I, you you mentioned teresa of avila her friend saint john of the cross says we must clean the window to let the light of the divine come into us and what you are saying, what you say in the book, is this inner divinity emerging. Yes. This, so and that's, that's one the of the things I love. I love that about orthodoxy is it, it, it as opposed to uh, Catholicism and Protestantism, to have nothing. Orthodoxy, and Charles introduced this to me, this idea of theosis. Theosis is such an important part of this whole belief system. Because it means with a little g, we become, we, uh, we are invited to become God. And not with this large g, a small g. We are, we are asked not to uh, be an imitation of Christ, but we are asked to be our own version of Christ in this world. But we and, can't do yeah. that unless we make these efforts. As he said, I am the first fruit of many. He himself calls us to this, 
And this, of course, is entirely different than the narcissistic madness that is found in superficial New Age thought, that we are we are the creator of the universe. That's insane. And yet we are one, as quantum physics uh, points to. Yes. And we cannot be that with our little selfish personality, our distractions, our irritability, all of that that needs to be cleansed. I'd like to quote the moment when you give us a very specific definition of this esoteric circle, and then let's go into from this personal inner work that must be done in order to connect with what you're calling the esoteric circle. So you say, you define it as the esoteric circle is a protective, singularly focused clan of homo sapiens whose cosmic job is to assist in the preservation of the psychological teachings of true humanity. I'll take it one more step. These teachings are designed to delicately lead individual humans out of their feral condition, teaching each of them the art of releasing personal and inherited karma and being twice born into its permanent deified state of salvation. Esoteric circle is not merely other humans who share this common bond, this anamkara, this soul companionship, soul friendship, this same hunger, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for real being. It is also something from above coming to us that is available to us, is it not? Yes. Charles had a term for it. He called it co-penetration. And this is this idea that we um, have beings from other worlds actually coexist with us in our psyche. And, and it may be a grandfather, it may be a guardian angel, maybe what some other deified being that's uh, um, under the uh, you know the E influence or D influence. But there is much more to this world than what we can see. And our five senses and living in this body prevents us from seeing that and experiencing that. And in search of the miraculous is aptly named because that's really what we're after. We're after this miraculous um, experience of the now, of God with us now, manual. We're after that now. We're not we're wait, we're not going to wait for. And I'm not going to be told by a church, or I'm not going to be told by a, a wrong doctrine or dogma that I'm not a child of God, that I don't have a birthright. I am going to claim that birthright and say, you know what? I've been sent here. We've all been sent here for a purpose. And I'm going to discover that purpose now in the midst of the apocalypse. And I'm going to claim that birthright. Because I am a child of light. And no matter what has happened to you in your life, especially with the church, how abusive the church can be in so many levels, no matter what, God still loves you. and God still wants to claim that you are a child of light and that you're not done and you have meaning and purpose, regardless of what has happened to you. And that's really the message to say there are others out there. You are not alone. And that really is the point, because I felt that way for a long time. I felt like I was the only one, and you're not the only one. Yes, and all the more so in these apocalyptic times, however we understand them. Certainly we see what's happening, climate change, economic instability, on and on. The internet that could in an instant disappear from a solar flare to large, right? the electromagnetic uh, event. And I was quite taken by the fact that what you are describing parallels what uh, I tried to share in my two novels, the one foretold, right? The desolation, how to survive in these impossible times, in these dramatic times, these catastrophic times, by precisely doing this inner work that makes us people of peace, 
and as you say specifically, that have something to carry on for the next generation, something of the wisdom of the ages that is not lost with everything else that may be lost. And that, that is quite intriguing right there. And I want to make this quote here, state this quote here. Our main interest is this, how will the esoteric circle remain unbroken? But more importantly, the question is, are you ready to stand in this esoteric circle as the world burns and drowns at the same time? And I want to bring up before I forget, you make the point several times, the Bible, the scriptures, the teachings, etc. tell us about what we can become, but not how, not the specifics, which are precisely what take us into this esoteric connection, companionship. Which is why we have to dig down deep and free ourselves. Tell me more about karmic burden. Are you talking about past lives that we carry with us? as well yeah you know charles called it pre-existence he never he never really would really say reincarnation so there's a difference there but the common denominator in all this is that we're not cosmically spiritually we're not from here that that birthright that that spark of god however you want to look at logos we are born with that, and that is eternal, and we are working and striving to return that, but we have to rid ourselves of what we have inherited genetically through our family line, also in our life, and that cross is the perfect symbol of the shedding of the karma. And that is the thing that must die. We must die to our old self. That's very Jungian, but we have to die to that old self. We have to allow for that past to die. And, and this includes, so much of the this stuff includes that I, trauma, right? Our traumas. You know, and you, and you will understand this as well. Much of the stuff, you know, this is my ninth book, but much of the books that I've written are really just all about me getting rid of the karma. You know, I was almost pursued by uh, another pastor who was uh, was really narcissistic and brutal to me and really tried to destroy me and for 30 years you know that really that really bothered me like why why was he so mean to me and i had to un i had to really dive deep and say what was me what was larry what was me what was larry and i had to figure out as robin would say in the thoughts in my head what are my thoughts and what are not my thoughts what are the thoughts that are coming from other realms? What are the other thoughts that are not mine? What are mine? What's me? And you have to sort through this. And especially with the trauma that we, we have experienced, you know, when you've experienced trauma, whether it's psychological, sexual, physical, you, those scars are deep, you know, and you have to be able to rise above that and be healed from that. And, and you've spoken about this in many of your sermons, but, you know, we, we need to be able to have our past um, healed in order to move on. And how do you do that? Um, that's the how. And that's why you need a teacher. And that's why you need someone there with you. That's why you need to get connected with this other side and begin to listen. At a, on a different level, because as Charles Ashton would say, prayer is about listening. It's not about speaking. It's, it's developing this inner uh, psychological way of listening to what is going on instead of just talking and spending your whole life saying words, but, but having them mean nothing. Um, that's what I've learned that most of my life has been. I, I, I want to be silent. I want to want to be able to learn how to listen. I want to identify a very specific how, which of course ties right into the watch of the heart, self-observation of fourth way, etc. And that is your statement 
your attention is your only tool on this inward journey. That's it. Attention is it. It's the only thing that you actually have that's yours. You know, you you have the, the your attention. Attention on what? When when many people sit there and say, "I want to learn how to meditate," and you sit down, you you try and calm your mind, you say a prayer, but within a few seconds you're daydreaming or you're asleep. And when you turn in with that was that that that. Um, that sense of metanoia, that turning inward, and you try to accomplish a hesychasm, that silence, you realize that you're just scattered. And you have you have no stability. And using the Jesus prayer as a as a almost like a a weapon. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's a shield. I don't know. It, it, Paul talks about that in Ephesians 6. The using the Jesus prayer to say, bring back the attention, bring back the attention, bring it back. And creating that over and over and over that stillness so that you can uh, you can use that during the day when you can use the Jesus prayer. Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, is has been the most crucial tool that I I have. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you, you know that Saint, Saint Theophan the Recluse points out that this is an example of divided attention, consciousness of the mercy of the Holy One, awareness of our need and dependence. So we invoke it into our need. And of course, for the Gurdjieff student, this divided attention is a crucial practical piece of information on the path to objective consciousness about oneself to a new way to relate to reality, etc. You quote another wonderful Holy Father, one of the greatest, St. Isaac the Syrian. And that by itself is a gift in this book. What is repentance? Abandoning what has been. I love that quote. Absolutely love it. You know, and, and and it speaks to maybe someone who is listening who you have you things have happened in your life. It is okay to just say it's over and move on. And there, there's that story of those two monks um, in the book. Um, and it's just this beautiful idea that you can just leave it, just move on. Move just on. just like the just like the word forgiveness comes to us from the Greek, literally means put the baggage down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, and, and it, you know, I, when I was growing up, I used to go to the altar and, and the Methodist church and say, "Lord, take these this burden from me." And I get it. There, there's there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing that drove me nuts about being in the church was nobody could tell me how to do it you know and it's taken a lifetime for me to sit there and over and over again let this go let this go and sometimes i struggle with some of these burdens and i just have to realize that i need to stop returning to the vomit you know i need to stop returning to that and just let it go and be able to move on and um there's so much that we have to do um so much activity going on around us in this world of ours. There's so much going on in terms of chaos. And there has to be a group of us that bind together. You know, Gurdjieff said there only needs to be 200 enlightened people. You know, uh, there has to be a group of us that, that are saying this is salvageable, that humanity is salvageable, that this creation is salvageable. So let me because pick we're up on that. Let me pick up on that. You uh, First of all, the simplicity of it. You say, how do you stay in this moment in order to escape the bonds of the past and the present? How? The key is to learn how to stay tuned to the moment, which is, of course, a universal teaching. But to what you just said, so esoteric circle, secret school established to educate those who have ears to hear, 
but it's something else. Are you ready to be among the ones who will preserve this ancient wisdom for the next generation so that humanity can rebuild itself, learning again how to coexist with the natural world as well as the holy presence of God within our collective psyches? So you are, it is a call. Are you willing to be a part of this secret school? So it is ultimately for the welfare of humanity, not merely our own survival. Absolutely. It's, a, it's the preservation. And what, a, what an amazing time to be alive. To be here at this, at this uh, cataclysmic time, it's just to me, you know, for a long time, it was terrifying because I have I have since climate change. I have since all this stuff for for years and it's haunted me. And now it's beginning to make sense because now I've accepted it and I'm, we're right in the middle of it. And I love it because we're right here in this. There's no better time to be alive than right now. Because, because now what is the paradox it's this, here. It's this accumulation of, of these few people that are going to preserve this teaching as the world goes into, into barbaric chaos. Uh, Aspensky talks about this in, in Esot Esotericism and Modern Thought, this essay in A New Model of the Universe. And he says it is a natural swing. It's a natural cycle for civilizations to rise and to fall, to rise and to fall. It's nothing out of the ordinary for to, what is happening is not out of the ordinary. Yes. It's a normal part of it. You, so you, what we you, are you, you remind me of, mm -hmm. of Gurdjieff saying that the good thing about when things are dark is that the ray of light coming through can be seen better and can be yeah. taken by those who can receive it in a way that may be less possible at another time so that's what you're saying in this paradoxical because obviously yes. nobody's happy about the catastrophes around us what what Absolutely you find not. exciting is the fact that what that there's this emergence of urgent relationship to these spiritual ideas of becoming of true becoming there's true. something there's something new being born Okay, there you go. That's it, right? Something there. new is being born. Something new, and I don't know what that is, but I want to be a part of it, and I want to be able to help accumulate what is already happened, and I want to be a part of that. And so it, it has I'm to be asked. To be so how how do people become part of it? What do people? What do lost, you, lonely seekers do to connect to right. that which is called esoteric circle? You know, we 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 are things start to happen to you once you get on this path. You begin to meet people, um, not many of them, but you begin to meet people. You begin to get books. You begin to get ideas, and you begin to realize that you need to work on yourself. And the most important thing that you can do is to meditate and to develop an inner life and to seek a development of uh, of peace within you. So that you can listen, so that you can discern who the people are that you should be around. Who's the right teacher? Because there are a lot of people out there who are saying, you know, similar things, but are charlatans. And not everybody who's wearing a, a robe or not everybody who's in the church is holy. And there are many evil, evil people within this these church structures. And, um, you know, some of the meanest people I've ever met are, are pastors and they're, they're, some of them are horrible people. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they're attracted to this, but you have to be able to discern this. You have to be able to uh, figure out who are, the, who do I need to be around? You know, and when I met Charles Ashton, I met Charles at the same time I, I met uh, a guy named Pastor Larry. I knew the difference. I wanted to be around Charles. I I, I when I met Charles, it was like there was a recognition, there was a remembrance, and that's a big term in fourth way, and in the in orthodoxy, remembrance, recognition, this i this idea that I recognize you. I mean, there was something familiar about Charles, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we when we talk about karma, 
you begin to sit there and say, I remember you. Mm -hmm. There's something familiar about you. Yeah, and as you said, things begin to happen. You will recall, of course, that it was at Charles's funeral that I mentioned to you this group in Chicago connected to Robin mm -hmm. Amos, and that was your entry into what a decade plus with him. So, from the even at the death of yeah. Charles, there was another door that opened directly. Exactly. Uh, I'll know. You know, you and I were pallbearers for Charles. With remember that coffin that had no handles, so we had to get underneath it. And afterward. Um, yeah, I just remember you, you were, it was like you were 10 feet tall to, in my memory. There, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. And I remember you saying to me, I know someone in Chicago. I hear you're living in Chicago. And I was living there. Um, and you said, I've got someone you might want to meet. And you gave me the phone number. And it was like, I, I met his name was Bernie uh, Edwards. And I met him at a coffee shop by the old school town of, uh, folk music and it was like i was a cia agent or something and i was just at the secret meeting you know and i was like kind of looking around like you know has anyone spotted us and uh it was huge and that's what's going to happen but you have to make these first step and that's where the joseph campbell stuff takes uh, brings us you have to make that first step into the wilderness where there is no path and are you willing to risk leaving everything that you've known the comfort of of the psychological comfort of home where everything is neat and tidy you know that god loves you and god forgives you and my, all, all these things that you think you know going into the wilderness and realizing that i'm alone are you willing to do that for a while because eventually you'll meet people like charles and ted and robin amos and lillian delavorius you know, you'll meet people like this and you just have to be patient and you have to take one step, one step into that wilderness. And that's the, that's the hero's journey. And not many people want to do that. You say at one point to set out on the way, that wilderness you just mentioned, we must necessarily go through an inner collapse of the personality. Similar to your Golgotha. Right. The but but one has to be willing to be shattered, shattered to get out of the pride, out of the illusions, to enter that radical humility that is the baseline of authentic spirituality. So it is yeah, a Moravia have called it Moravia have called it moral bankruptcy. And you get to the point where you just say, I know nothing. I know nothing. I know nothing. Lead me, teach me, do with me as you will. That's been one of my prayers. Lord, do with me as you will. That has been a prayer that I've had for, for 30 years. Do with me as you will. Lead me. Let me be useful. I, I want to be worthy of my hire. You know, we're, all, have, we're yeah. given a cosmic. I want to be a, I have a cosmic job. I got to do my job. What is it? I'll do would, it. I go. would attach to that. Beautiful saying, which is very Thomas Merton-ish, right? I don't know where I'm going, but I think that the desire to please you does in fact please you. So yes. lead me, right? All of that ultimately yes. is abandonment to the divine providence. Absolutely. This is mystical. This is a mystical journey. And you have to just jump into it. Jump into it and realize that when you can't see the way by jumping into the void, into the darkness, it that jumping actually creates a path in front of you. Mm -hmm. That you actually create uh, uh, the way, which is the original name of Christianity. You create the way, the path, by jumping into the void. And when you think there's nothing there, this is insane. Why would you go any further? Stay, stay with what you know. Now jump into nothing. And in doing that, you actually create space. And to me, that has happened so many times in my life where this abandonment, just, Lord, I'm just going to do it. 
it doesn't make any sense financially. It doesn't make any sense spiritually. It doesn't make any sense, at, you know, with my career. It's just jumping out. You know, I've moved. I've moved to Chicago uh, without a job. <laughs> I've quit. I bought a house without a job. You know, there's just these things where I I just was a, I, I just said, Lord, lead me on. And this relationship that you have with, with God and with the other side reacts to you. And you begin to have this reaction from unseen entities that are around you. And they've always been around you. And, but you, you have to leap into it as the hero. You have to leap into it and say, I'm going to act. And in doing so, you create something that's not there. You mentioned the term oubliette, right? I, I don't know whether, is that from Muraviev, perhaps? Oubliette yes. is a term I've known since first grade. Because mm. in French history, Louis XI, the Spider King, would put his poor victims into these deep, lost places. Oubliette from the French verb oublier, to forget, where people are forgotten, you know. It is ultimate desolation. And so there is something of ultimate desolation in a world where there is no God, there is no sacred, there is no wonder. As you know so well, the Gnostics assumed that was this world. And you have in some ways said that, in my view, that that can't be right because there's too much beauty, you know, eternity in a grain of sand type of thing. And yet at the same time, in the midst of that divine grace visible to us, there is the devastation of psychic uh, barrenness that is a prison, if you will. But in any case, in this, quote, true personality, after having been fully developed here within the oubliette, will return as a healthy cell to the body of the one, and participate in the overall goal of the Heavenly Father, which I shall now state in your words, a total transformation of all of creation into an expression of pure love, the energy of the ages which sustains all life of the cosmos. This is the goal of the esoteric circle. That's big. That's huge. <laughs> we better have help from above, right? But yeah, what a glorious right. thing to individually in our loneliness go into that wilderness, that dark wood like Dante. Lost and alone only to discover that when we make connection on the other side, we are connected to something this big, this huge. With one, two, three, a dozen brothers and sisters real family, spiritual family, working here for the divine. And that is more evident now than ever because of these apocalyptic times, as you're pointing out. And that's why you say that there is reason to be excited about these frightening times. And I want to read two more pieces that complete your book. This is the resurrection. This rebirth within each moment of your earthly existence. You recall the movie that I created, The Resurrected Life. I love that way to see it and what Charles had to say about that. The resurrected life, you, you call it this rebirth within each moment of your earthly existence. The accumulation of energy throughout this process of rebirth is the energy you need to acquire permanence, or theosis. And then the writer comes out. Then the secrets whispered to the angels will reach you, and you will have the ears with which to hear. May this be great hope for whoever hears this, whoever finds your book on audiobook or Kindle or Amazon and realize what this what this represents, what this 
this call you've you've named it several times in the book this is a call hey you out there in the desert in the wilderness you're not alone join us and in that usness something extraordinary will manifest even in the middle of the catastrophe you say this is the most important book you've written yes what what urged you to do it what got you focused here i needed to share what has been given to me and i could not go on without sharing what has been given i can't i can't hold it i can't hold it and i want to give hope to those people who out there right now who, who need to hear that that they're not alone and that there is this calling that you have been hearing is real and that there is an inner there's there's an inner church and it's out there and it's deeper than the outer church and no matter what has happened to you there's a group out there there are companions on the way there's a specific teacher for you there's a there are companions on the way well the youtube channel that i started at the beginning of the pandemic was really about that this accumulation this gathering up of people who are scattered who need to hear that they're not alone you know i needed to hear that i had charles where would i have been without charles where would i have been without Rob? Um, i needed people out there and i need to be that for someone you need to be that for someone we all need to share this and because without sharing it we 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 kill it that's that's my big sin my big sin is by holding on to this and not sharing it and not saying this is this is there's no time to be afraid there's no time to be afraid right now in this in this world we have to gather up we have to gather up the knowledge the wisdom and we need to gather up the people and we need those of us who have ears to hear we have to work hard and we have to work diligently we have to work until it's until we our time is done we don't know when that time is up and we have to work that was the one of the one of the um characteristics that charles and robin had diligent workers constantly working at this never really never really putting that that guard down where they were just nepsis they they had they were alert constantly and i want to be like that and so little groups here and there even not connected with each other form the esoteric circle yes because and what tire tire day shut and said everything that rises must converge hmm. everything that rises must converge you know we if if we are all doing this separately then we're communicating with one another you know there's so much going on there's so much going on past my five senses and i want to develop those characteristics the you know charles was was clairvoyant i mean i we're we're called to to, to develop these psychological characteristics of the saints we're all called to do this even as civilization crumbles under our feet and all the values and traditions disappear here going the other way against the current yes. full of hope and certainty and we dive inwardly on this this hero's journey because we have compassion for a world that is suffering amen may your book reach those who can receive who have ears to hear